High Adventure. Tonight's exciting story by Ron Evans is called Flight 603. Strata cruiser Silverbird 2X6 took off from London for New York on time. It was a calm, pleasant evening in July. In addition to a crew of seven, she carried 21 passengers, slightly less than one-fifth her normal complement. And among these was the newly appointed secretary of the World Peace Committee. Pilot Captain Alex Olmston had no reason to expect trouble. This was routine stuff, this long trip across the Atlantic. He had flown it a hundred times before. Nice time they must be having back there. Hmm? All oh, the passengers? <laughs> yes, Skipper. Plenty of room to stretch out. Anyone uh, interesting? Well, Brenda says you'd better do your stuff with Eric Smistet. With who? Smistet, head of the World Peace Conference. You know, the press have been playing him up as the biggest hope of the world yet. Pulling out every cliche in the book. Poor devil. Why do you say that? Because he'll fail. Can't help it, can he? Human nature being what it is. Uh, he's a clever character. Doesn't matter. Know who's lined up against a man like that? You tell me. Vested interests, Tab. Line after line of vested interests. In other words, it's always going to pay someone to keep a war going somewhere. Hmm? You've said it. You know, Skipper, flying hasn't put you up among the angels. That's right. Well, I'll go and do my stuff. Must keep the paying customers happy. Mm-hmm. Oh, incidentally, there's an eight-year-old child back there, travelling alone, an orphan. Parents killed in Ireland. Give her a smile, too, Skipper. Little Scrap looks as though she could do with it. <laughs> Handsome here goes aft. OK, Tab, keep her on George. By now, she ought to be able to fly herself home. The 8,000-ton freighter Molly Hawks, ploughing her cumbersome way through the Caribbean, began a corkscrewing motion. Sea had been piling on sea all day. For hours, the sky had been an unnatural cast of yellow. As darkness fell, a wind came up, lashing the waves into white crests. Mr. Harris, I'm turning in. If the weather freshens any more, I want to know about it. Do you think we're in for a blow? There's one around somewhere. Get Sparks to raise the Met boys again and see what he can find out. Aye, aye, Captain. I suppose he's established contact again. An hour ago. But he's moaning like blazes at the equipment he's got. I'm not surprised. The owners ought to be pulled in for this lot. We're off the normal sea lanes here. If there's going to be some dirty weather, I'd rather not be out on a limb. We should be back in action soon enough now. Mr. Cairns has completed the engine repairs. I wonder if Mr. Cairns knew what he was in for when he signed on on this line. Those ruddy engines... Might as well try to patch a bucket with sticking plaster. Well, let's hope they behave now, sir. We're in for a bit of bouncing, whatever happens. Aye, you're right about that. In the meteorological station on Bermuda, the weatherman began to plot the course of Hurricane Laura. Looks like Laura's a gal with a mind of her own, Dave. You think so? She's not conforming to any standard pattern. Take a look at this. Well, I see what you mean. I should say she's a gal doesn't know her own mind. She'll be a hard one when she does hit. Well, that's for sure. Well, hold it. There's something coming in now from one of the weather ships. On course route 75, predictable as a clockwork train, Silver Bird cruised comfortably at 400 miles per hour, at a height of 32,000 feet, well above the path of the normal storm. Uh, sure is nice to be going home. <laughs> is it? Well, that's a funny question. Is it nice to be going home with your conscience? That's what I mean. Oh, come off it, Sylvia. Not that again. I hoped and hoped all along that your takeover wouldn't be accepted. Uh, you should worry. It'll put you in the millionaire class. At a cost to a lot of people. So what? Other men have wives and families, Mike. Now listen, I can't carry the world. We had enough without, without this latest venture. 
I never heard a woman carp at a man making money before. It's not the making of it. it it's the means by, by oh, which... Honey, you... you can't protect all the people all the time. And will being in the millionaire bracket make us any happier? It's the first time you and I have traveled together anywhere for years. And now all I get from you is a load of morality talk. Yeah. You know, the thing about money is knowing when to cry enough. And that's never, Sylvia. And you do your part, make no mistake about it. Hmm? You make demands on me all the time. Oh, yeah, yeah, you do. You and the kids. No, but... no, no. Don't you shift your conscience onto me. It's the old law of supply and demand, that's all. Mike, which came first, wars or weapons? One of the weapons from the arms factory that you've taken over might... Well, it, it might blow your own son to glory. Hey, that's a pretty crummy thing to say. But it's a fact, though, isn't it? You know, Sylvia, you, you seem crazy. People are not going to stop manufacturing arms just because I opt out. <laughs> the survival of the fittest. Is that really what you believe? It's a fact of life. No. The truth is, Mike, that you like making money. Big money. It gives you a great feeling. You want us to demand things. You want your sons to have more pocket money than the next, despite the fact that you never see them. You want your wife's mink to be the most expensive. So what if I do? But it's meaningless. You've got your priorities mixed. Can't uh, you see? You spend your life getting at the expense of a family you never see. You don't mind spending my priority, as you call it. Oh, Mike. It's something you seem to expect. Sylvia and Mike Dutton spoke quietly, despite their bitter differences of opinion. It was dark. Some of the passengers were already switching off the individual bulkhead lights, easing back their chairs, accepting pillows from the two hostesses, Brenda O'Brien and Diana Cameron. The small girl, who was travelling alone, was comfortably stretched out across three seats, a blanket pulled up to her chin. Her bright eyes observing Eric Smithstead, who sat across the aisle, chin on hand, gazing out at the night sky now thinly pricked with stars. Tab. Hmm? That compass reading you just gave me. That's all okay, Skipper. Well, one of us is wrong. One of us has to be. What gives? I don't know yet. Tab, I was back there chatting up Spisted. He was watching the stars. So? Take your nose out of your instrument and look for yourself. <laughs> well, tell me I'm crazy. For Pete's sake, tell me I'm crazy. I wish I could. The compass can't be wrong. Can it? We'll try a little correcting procedure based on observation. Steering by the stars and the seats of our pants, hmm? You uh, have a better idea? Sorry, Skipper. Calling Bermuda Control. Calling Bermuda Control. This is Air World Flight 603. Do you read me? That's good. Bermuda Control, because we seem to be having a little trouble up here. Compass jammed. Would you give us a reading? What the blazes is that? Bermuda Control. This is Bermuda Control. What's going on up there? We're losing height fast, Skipper. Flight, can you locate the trouble? I'll try. Tab, get back and see what's happening among the customers. Well, what do I tell them? Tell them anything but the truth. We're in trouble, Tab. Real trouble. I'll uh, come back to you in a minute, Bermuda. Right now, I'm a busy man. Despite the flippancy of his tone, Commander Ormston was a worried man. The plane continued to lose height, no longer with the speed of the initial shock, but with slow persistence. The needles and the altimeters crept round. 32,000, 30,000, 25,000, 20,000, 15,000. At 15,000, he managed to level off. The compass remained fixed. He was now in cloud and unable to take a bearing. His one hope lay in Bermuda. This is Air World 603 to Bermuda Control. Captain Ormston speaking. Come in, 603. What the heck's going on up there? We've uh, had some sort of an explosion aboard. My height now reads 15,000. Compass is still jammed. The flight engineer is making a check. Can you estimate my position, please? Come back to me. 
But make it fast, will you? Roger. Sabotage, Captain Orbson. I'm not sure how or why. That's for a later estimate flight. Just give me the damage. As the flight engineer checked out the damages, First Officer Tab Hamilton returned to the flight deck and slid into his place. Together they listened to the estimated damages. They had long ago passed the point of no return. They knew they couldn't possibly reach New York. And with a sick feeling in the pit of his stomach, Captain Ormston guessed he was further off course than he realised. The fuel leakage is bad, Skipper. No hope of it being temporary. Okay, flight, I read you loud and clear. I'm sorry, Skipper. Who isn't? They were still losing height. Flight 603 still had contact with Bermuda control, but the possibility of landing in Bermuda had to be ruled out. Fuel would not permit it, and the Strato cruiser had lost much of her maneuverability. Ormston called the cabin crew to the flight deck and put them in the complete picture. He then requested them to return aft and reassure the passengers that everything was under his control. And he thanked heaven those passengers could not sense the terror that gripped him. The aeroplane began to buffet as she flew into the storm path. The command to fasten seat belts blazed above the bulkhead. I, I guess we're in a pretty serious jam, Mike. Yeah. Kind of cuts you down to size, don't it? Uh-huh. Scared, honey? I'm out of my wits. Oh, don't worry. The captain's got everything under control. It's okay, darling. I don't need soothing syrup. Uh, listen, there's a little girl back there. What say we ask the hostess if she could take this spare seat with us? Yeah, I'll get her. And if it's any use to you. I'm scared, too. Oh, I'm scared of blazes. Oh, but oh, what is it? Why are we being hey. thrown about so badly? You're right. Yeah. Hey, Mike, it's, it's getting worse. Oh. 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 Let's get that kid along with us, huh? What's our height, Tab? 10,000. Wind velocity? Anemometer readings erratic, Skipper. Flight, what would you give us for staying afloat if I can put her down on the water? Three minutes, maybe five, depending on height of waves. Maybe nothing. Have we any option? No option, Flight. No option at all. This is AWF 603 to Bermuda Control. Do you still read me? We're still with you, Captain Ormston, and we're staying that way. That's fine, Bermuda. I am now flying at 10,000 feet, but I don't know how long I can maintain that height. We're getting a good deal of buffeting. I'd like to know the state of the sea right now. I request a ditching heading, Bermuda. Captain Armstrong, this is the Chief Control Officer, Bermuda Control. Any alternative? Negative. We'll give you the heading and put you directly onto the Met Boys. We shall alert any shipping in your immediate area to stand by. And good luck, Captain. All right, Mr. Harris, what's the word? Passenger jet in trouble. She's going to ditch. We've been asked to render assistance. In this? Bermuda's in contact, sir. Request a personal talk. Tell Sparks I'm on my way. What's the weather angle now? Hurricane Laura's getting up to 60, but still moving north. Ah, thank heaven for that. Bermuda thinks she'll bypass us, but it isn't exactly ditching weather, is it, Skipper? Must the poor blighter put her down here? It seems he has no choice. Time factor? 30 minutes. Master all hands. Aye, aye, sir. Uh, good evening, Sparks. Uh, Bermuda on the air now, sir. Uh, hello, Bermuda. This is McCulloch, captain of the Molly Hawks. I understand you need our assistance. I'm very glad to hear you, Captain. We have an Air World Strata cruiser in your area. She's gone a ditch. You seem to be the only people near enough to help. Just tell us what you want us to do, Bermuda. Mr. Cairns, you've got the task of your career. If you're ever prayed over those engines, pray over them now. Aye, aye, sir. They've given us the estimated ditching area, and that's only a few minutes from our present position. It's a question of maneuverability. With all the luck in the world, they're not going to have much more than three minutes after they hit. May heaven help them. Never mind about heaven, Mr. Harris. 
We're the ones on the spot. We must break out of some sort of foam path. What can you give us? Tab, give me that microphone. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. It uh, seems we're having a bit of excitement this trip. <laughs> Understatement of the year. I'm, uh, I'm going to attempt a sea landing. Now, don't worry. This is all a part of rehearsed procedure. Who are you kidding? But it does rely on your absolute cooperation. Please obey without question anything, and I repeat, anything the crew may ask you to do. There is a ship standing by to assist us and take us off. I'm sending the first officer back to speak to you. Thank you, and good luck. Sylvia half turned in her seat to look at her husband. Neither could say what they thought because of the child now sitting between them. They were fully aware they might only have a few minutes of life left. First of all, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to fool you. This is a tricky operation and the weather's against us. On the credit side, we have the best and most experienced captain in Air World's fleet. What we have to do now is remove everything liable to break loose on impact. And I mean everything. Handbags, briefcases, parcels. All light luggage, however small and insignificant you may think it. I'm also going to suggest you take off your shoes. The stewardesses will start collecting the gear now. Mike... Will we come down very hard? Yeah, I'm afraid so. The hostesses will hand you pillows, and when you get them, crouch forward in your seats and push your heads down into them. As Tab Hamilton gave instructions, the passengers proceeded to pile up shoes and hand luggage for the stewardesses to remove. Sylvia Dutton gripped the older woman's hand so hard, Sylvia's rings bit into her flesh. On the flight deck, Ormston now had direct contact with the Molly Hawks. Captain McCulloch, sir. Uh, ten, thirteen feet. Um, two minute intervals. Wind's abating a little, but I'd still put it down at uh, forty-five. I'm going to try to ditch across the swell and get the passengers out across the wings. Can you pick up the foam path? I'm still trying. Mr. Cairns, I want this ship lit up like a ruddy Christmas tree. Mr. Harris! That foam path's inadequate. Break out more drums with lights inside. Aye, aye, sir. Captain Ormson, let me know the minute you pick us up. We have boats and rafts at the ready. I'll give you a countdown. If he can't see us now, he'll never see us. If he's going to ditch, I wish he'd ditch. I'm not happy about this. Shut up, Mr. Harris. Aye, aye, sir. Do you think they've a chance? The deceleration forces on ditching beggars' description... If they hit a wall of water, that's it. And that means a pilot must have the judgment of heaven. It does, Mr. Harris, it does. As they hit the water, they bounce off the sudden check. And on re-entering the water, although they're still traveling at the fair speed, they'll be brought to an immediate halt. I don't have to tell you what that means. The deceleration smashes everything to blazes. Anything not firmly secured is likely to be flung forward. And even chairs with their occupants may be torn from their mountings. Injuries may be severe. On impact, the fuselage is almost certain to be stove in. You want me to go on? You sound as if you're quoting. I am, from a flying manual. If the fuselage is stove in, there'd be an onrush of water. You're quite right, Mr. Harris. With immediate failure of light. Flotation period? Your guess is as good as mine, Mr. Harris. My guess is there won't be any. There's going to be. There has to be. There are 28 people inside that aircraft, Mr. Harris. If you're convinced they're doomed, I would be obliged if you'd keep your sentiments to yourself. AWF 603 to the Molly Hawks. I see you well. Oh, thank heaven for that, Captain. How's the water, friend? Warm enough temperature-wise. She's abated a little. Swell's still running high. But I give the breaking period two and a quarter minutes now. Thank you, Captain. I won't be talking again before we hit. We'll finish the conversation aboard then, Skipper. I carry the best whiskey in the world. Roger. Roger and good luck. Break out the boats, Mr. Harris. Aye, aye, sir. 
Silverbird listened once more to Bermuda control, and it seemed to Ormston that Bermuda was throwing every instruction in the book at him. We've jettisoned everything we can, Skipper. Roger. Freeze fuel. Fuel frozen. Tab. Skipper. Everything secure back there? All secured. That kid. She's okay, Annex. Don't worry. Stewardesses. No panic. They've got the drill. Flight. Buckle yourself in the cabin and stand by to open the emergency exit. Roger. Now, Tab. We've work to do. The men on the deck of the Molly Hawk saw the lighted strato cruiser come out of the air with a terrifying swiftness. On the water, easily lit now by the makeshift foam path, life rafts rose up and down to the fierce swell, while the men in the lifeboats waited on the surface of the water, themselves hazarding their lives almost in the path of the fated aircraft. There wasn't a man in the Molly Hawks and the shore-based Met Station or Bermuda Control who wasn't praying at that moment, however he prayed. Sylvia? Yeah? I just wanted you to know that what you said made sense. It's going to be all right, Mike. It has to be. Sure, it's going to be all right. Hang on to the kid, Mike. I've got to. We're all going to hang on together, aren't we, honey? This is it, Tab. Mr. Harris. I'm counting, Captain. What is it now? Uh, Fifteen. One's being helped, I think. Oh, if it wasn't so dark. We need more flares. Yes, sir. Twenty-two. Twenty-three. Can't they move faster? If they panic on those wings. There's a compliment to twenty-eight, Mr. Harris. Twenty-eight. She's going under fast. Twenty-five. Twenty-six. She's going to plunge. Twenty-seven. Twenty-seven. She's going. Tell them to get those boats clear before they get caught, Mr. Harris. Get away. She's going. Twenty-eight. He's on the wing. He's jumped for it. Break out the whiskey, Mr. Harris. Aye, aye, sir. Sabotage, Captain Ormston? In the name of fortune, why? Who knows? Some nut. Maybe they were warmongers after the head of the World Peace Commission. Or maybe they were peace advocates after the arms manufacturers. Either way, it was useless. All that happened was that 28 people lived this fear up there. I can taste it still. You did a magnificent job, Captain. I did a job, that's all. It's harder to be responsible for life than it is to destroy it. Saboteurs should remember that. Oh, here you are, Harris. (laughs) Help yourself, man. You've earned it. Thanks, Skipper. Now I've the chance, there's a question I want to ask you, sir. Go ahead. You quoted me a lot of stuff from a flying manual. Do you read such things? Normally I don't, Mr. Harris. But we had one lying around at home. Oh? The flight engineer of 603 is my son, Mr. Harris. You might say I had a very personal interest. High Adventure is produced by Henry Duffenthal.